Okay, good afternoon. We will uh, go ahead and uh, we're pleased to welcome our uh, final lecturer before we start with the student presentations. And again, for the students, if you haven't, please send them to me and I will post them on Indigo. And then again, after, uh, after this session, uh, we'll bring in Socorro and take care of all the checkout meal cards and uh, things like that. So without further ado, we'll uh, continue and make sure everybody shift around so you can see the blackboard. And uh, Rasha, thank you. Good to have you here. Uh, that's it. I said, if you need to, no, 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 I don't need to. So I just have to find the right. Uh, you know, my notes are, uh, are uh, kind of, they're in Sanskrit, but oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, is there? Okay, so um, thanks again for um, coming to this second of my talks. So as I mentioned, my talk had two parts. One was uh, QCD at High Park of Nicees. Um, Um, and I argue to you that this is very interesting for a number of reasons. And, and there's a specific application of this to every line communities, right? So specifically the problem of fertilization. Um, and, and the um, thing I, um, what I want to emphasize is that all of my statements are, are somewhat robust in, a, in so called radio asymptotics. Um, where, the, um, where x is very small, and remember x is the square rs, where I'm keeping this fixed. Right. right, and S goes to infinity. So this goes to zero. So, so I'm working with this regime. And I've argued to you that this alpha S in this regime, for reasons I will talk about, is very, very small. So you would say, oh, this is like a non-interacting theory, but not quite because there's another scale that comes in, which is the occupancy. Of partons. And the effective coupling is alpha S times N, which is the order. So that's gives what that's what gives the tiny non-trivial strong report. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's that's kind of uh, I don't want to really argue. And that's why it's interesting because this is very much like condensed matter physics, right? So in condensed matter physics, alpha electrokinetic is quite small, but you see that you have very interesting non-trivial many-body phenomena in various regimes. Uh, and it's because the, the actual, it's not the actual coupling of the theory that's relevant, they're often emergent scales, which make the effective coupling large. And that's where you get very strong uh, very non trivial strong quality. And I'm claiming that in QCD, the similar kind of dynamics that goes on, but the physics is really like that of condensed matter physics. So, many body correlation is very important. Uh, so, you heard about the twist expansion, I guess, in some of the talks. So, all twists in QCD become important. Uh, so, this is a very kind of interesting novel regime that we would like to explore uh, at VLC and within the electron line. Right. So that was kind of the motivation. So um, what I what I started my talk with uh, was I talked about the Eichnoll expansion, 
Um, uh, and this was in in high energy kinematics. So for the momentum scales to a very large. So if I looked at some say virtual photon, which then along the quark and quark dipole, it's been scattered scales to this as one. Well. As for example, what's happened in EIC. So then the momentum scales say this is more like Q minus, right? So, and this say has momentum P plus, right? Then momenta um, P plus, Q minus are both very large. Uh, and so, just for convenience, sometimes I'll just talk about Q plus or Q minus, but uh, I just mean that expect, you know, Terms to order one of the plus of the minus are very small. And so I argue to you that um, already from QED, that you could see that cycle of expansion is a very robust way to think about things. And what I talked about last time was you know, constructing the S matrix, so which I call S of some initial state, which might reflect the asymptotic state, say, of a virtual photon pair virtual photon um, and how it evolves you know, under the influence of the QCD Hamiltonian to then form this very complicated state that then interacts with this nucleus mm -hmm. and then it goes off into some final state, right? So that would be the S matrix of this process. And what I argued that you could, you could write this thing um, in this much simpler form where um, you could write this as some F Function capital that same function x per i, right? And so this object was what was the i component, right? So it was some exponential um, of some minus i, some fundamental x per for the i component function x per times some charge density. So you have color, charge density, of x per. And what I pointed out was that the time. Uh, kind of just dropped out. So in the original thing that I wrote down, which was this QED interaction potential that was time ordered time x plus, but now you see that the result only depends on this purely two-dimensional dynamics. So there's a factorization of this two-dimensional dynamics of the interaction. And so in fact, I could write this thing here, this matrix element here, as uh, but remember, I argued that you can write my uh, initial state as the evolution from minus infinity to zero, the unitary operator representing the evolution of the q speed Hamiltonian, right, of some bare state, and similarly for the final state. So I would just reverse, for f, I would just reverse uh, this from infinity to zero. Uh, and then I could write the final result in a form where your initial state then be a sum for all intermediate parton states. Um, and similarly for the final state. And so these are all the states that the initial bare state, which would be this, this photon, would evolve through, right? So all the complicated states. So what I mean by that is that you could have a state. So you're gonna have a virtual photon coming in, right? That's your binary state. And then this could evolve into a virtual photon times a future bar, which I would represent by something like this, right? And then I could have state which is gamma star, bar, muon, which then I could represent as on like that, right? And so on, right? And so this is a sum over all possible such intermediate states, right? So the state is a non-trivial state that's actually coming to the, to the, the superposition of all these complex states. But despite that, the actual interaction with this object is quite simple, okay? And so, so, it, so what you can show 
is that this guy here, this initial state and everything I'm writing also holds for the final state is can be written in this form, which is as I had earlier on the other side of the board, I had this U of zero of minus minus A, and this I can expand. And so this can be written as A plus sub over N, uh, and then I can expand out the unitary operator. So this would be the Hamiltonian of my initial state, the energy minus the energy, so this is state I. And so what I'm doing is that I'm expanding around the interaction terms in my QCD or QED Hamiltonian, which are then powers of the coupling. Okay, so this would be E, E squared, and so on. So it's a perturbative expansion. So I can then do a perturbative expansion of the state and then plug it into here and then compute the cross section for various processes up to, to arbitrary orders and coupling, right? The coupling is very small. So this is nothing but Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory. So when you do quantum mechanics, right? Uh, that's what you're doing, right? You're adding in energy denominators. Um, so you assume that you have some Hamiltonian, which can be written as um, H naught plus V, right? This is a perturbation, right? And then you do a systematic expansion and powers of this perturbation of the Hamiltonian. And this H of I is just nothing but this V that I wrote here. So you have a systematic expansion of all orders. You take this, you plug this in here, and then you calculate. So now I'm going to illustrate uh, this for the problem of interest. Okay, so this was all just a build up to illustrate the point that I wanted to get to, which is where things start to get interesting from the QCD point of view. So let's consider the following process. Um, again, where now oh, I think so, I'm going to bore you with this diagram, but uh, bear with me. So, this is again your virtual photon scattering on QR. And now let me represent this nucleus, right, that I have here. So, remember yesterday. In my calculations of this object here, I, this was some classical field that I called A minus. And in fact, you remember this chi is an integral over Vx plus of this A minus or X plus, you know, it's okay. Um, and so this is where the effect of this external potential comes in. So for now, humor me by saying, you know, you treat the nucleus as some classical field. So that's the approximation network again. And this is kind of a, uh, so I have this instantaneous interaction with the classical field. And this classical field is highly localized at some position here. Okay, so in other words, so if you imagine that you are a virtual photon that fluctuated to some quark antiphoton pair, and then the nucleus is coming towards you, it's this highly Lorentz contracted object. So you're sitting and you're seeing this. I learn it's contracted on words you, and that's what this represents. Okay, so that's the scattering. Any questions? Okay. And so basically, what this classical field represents, and I'm going to demonstrate that, is really multiple scatterings, <laughs> right? So Another way of thinking about this is that imagine that this nucleus then has many nucleons and this classical field really represents multiple scatterings of all of these objects here. Okay. And so that's kind of all the physics that's embedded in, in this description, which one has to, of course, justify. 
Um, and one way to think about that is that is again the physics of quantum mechanical coherence. So imagine that you know your nucleus now at rest was a bunch of nucleons, right? And they had quarks in there and perhaps some gluons, right? But now if this if this virtual photon is coming and scattering on this object, then the nucleus has some diameter, which is say twice its radius, right? Which is twice eight to one third, where A is the atomic number. <clears throat> if the this is a there's a quantity called the Yofe time or Yofe length. Which is one over twice the nuclear mass times x, right? Where x represents, you know, what we're talking about along. So if this is much larger than e to the r, than r, right? Twice r, right? Then essentially, this object of scattering these qq bars, they see all of these guys simultaneously. They can't resolve. So its wavelength is much longer than the width of the nucleus, right? And that would occur for an X much less than e to minus one third in units of current inversely units of Fermi inversely. And so, so at these values of X, right? Uh, which is not terribly small X, right? If you put your, wait, what is X now? Unit. Well, it's think of it as in units of the nuclear mass. Okay. So it's it's in so there's a nuclear mass. This this is but this is a length in units of Fermi, right? I'll let you do the conversion. Okay. So but this is the this is the formulation. Think about it, right? So these are the same dimensions on either side. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But this is not X uh, as usual, Bjork and X. Uh, it is X. I mean, but you have to write it in terms of the appropriate units. I'm saying parametrically, this is the scale that controls what X is. Okay. It's my steering time. Remember, my this lecture it was steering time of saturation. Zero to maximum. I would still it's the same. Yeah. Well, this equation has the right dimensions, right? That's all you need. Okay. But then you see that R changes with A, right? So R will change with A. So the relation is this, okay? Um, and so it's you, you could put in numbers and you'll see it's not terribly small x. So essentially, this quark antiquark pair, so you're sitting on this quark antiquark pair, you can't tell the difference between the color charges, the first nucleon and the last nucleon, right? You, they all hit you right, right away. It's like this, it's an instantaneous car crash, right? And so, so you see a lot of color charge simultaneously, right? How do you tell what's the difference between the color charge and the first nucleon, last nucleon? I should emphasize that the size of this QQ bar is much smaller than the diameter of the proton, say. And so basically it's interacting with color charge all the way through. And that's like a random walk problem. Right, so it sees on the average some zero color charge, but it's going to see large fluctuations in color charge. So that's kind of the underlying motivation behind this picture. Okay, so this makes sense that essentially it sees this very large amount of color charge, which generates some field, right? And that's a field that's this A minus that I'm talking about here. Any questions? So this, this is the phenomenon of color coherence. So as you go to large X, then you start, you know, then this object will just scatter up one nucleon, have a hard scattering. But when you go to small X, it can't tell the difference between these. Okay. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point if something is quite a bit unclear. Um, yeah, so this is, I'm working implicitly kinematics, and I mean sloppy, yes. Sure. Even for arbitrarily higher energies, I can 
get some few square. Just that X is, uh, I mean, not very small. Right? So That's where this yeah. radio asymptotics comes in. So eat. Okay, go on. I was pre no, assuming your question. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. that's exactly, exactly my question. So even even at very high energies, I can still prove it sufficiently, you know, sufficiently small manner so that I can uh, not have color. Uh, well, so 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 you brought up a, a key point, which is again. Let me draw this picture again, right? So, of course, if, if you have your dipole be very big, right, it's going to see. A white nucleon, right? It's not going to see any color, right? Because you have confinement in the scale, right? So the whole thing is some intrinsically non perturbative scattering, which you have to understand, you know, that would be kind of involve more nuclear physics, right? But, but I'm really talking about this peculiar Ray J regime, right? Where Q squared is large, so the dipole is small. So the size of the dipole. Is one over Q, right? So the dipole is small, but then X is also small, right? So Q is large, so it's much larger than lambda Q C D. So it's smaller than the size of the nucleon, so then X is very small, right? So it's much less than eight to the minus one third, and so that's why I have coherence. So the radio regime automatically induces coherence. Okay, that's another way of saying it. Was that answering? Yeah. So to first approximation, this picture is reasonable. <clears throat> so you say, okay, what happens if you have quantum fluctuations, right? So what happens now by a meta gluon? How does this picture change? Now, let me be a little bit more quantitative and define the cross section for the scattering. So, gamma star A, if you like, uh, is an integral. So, I'll explain in a moment that this is an integral from 0 to 1, z, z squared by curve. So this is a very, very nice intuitive formula. It says that the cross section for a photon, so this is in deep plastic scattering, right? You have some, uh, you have some virtual photon, a scattering of a nucleus, right? That's this object here, uh, is a convolution of the wave function for the this virtual photon to go into a QQ bar pair. And then times a cross section of this QQ bar pair to interact with the nucleus. And the very fact that I could even write this was all coming from this simplification that I mentioned last time in terms of the use boost operator, right? When I use boost operator, I could separate the evolution of the wave function from this from the actual scatter. And that's where this factorization represents. So this is QED. So in QED, I can calculate virtual photon splitting into a quark and quark pair, and this is QCD. And in essence, that's the beauty of deep plastic scattering, say compared to proton-proton collisions, right? In proton-proton collision, you don't have such a finely tuned probe that you can calculate with great accuracy in QED, which is a theory we understand very well, it's highly accurate. And so then this QCD part is then factorized to this very kind of nice scattering, right? Um, and so this object here, the dipole scattering cross section. Uh, oh, by the way, so the Z is the momentum fraction of this work, the photon virtual momentum that's carried by the quark, and one minus Z is that carried by the anti quark, and then Z goes from zero to one. So it's just a longitudinal momentum quark uh, compared to the anti quark. 
And the size of this cucubar dipole, as I mentioned, this is some S per. Say this is at some Y per. And say the gluon is emitted at some position C per. So the, what I mean is that the quark scattered at some position X per in the nucleus, the anti quark is at Y per, and the gluon position Z per. And so this object here, which is interesting to us, so this is very well known in QED. It's, it's some vessel functions. It's some uh, modified vessel functions. Um, so it's very well known. So the sigma dipole, can be written as twice the integral or the impact parameter of the scattering. And then I'm going to introduce some mumbo jumbo, which I will justify later. So what do I mean by this? So this dipole cross-section, I'm integrating. So when I have two vectors, X perp and Y perp, right? I, through them, I can construct some difference variable, R perp. And then I can, I can construct the impact parameter. So for simplicity, I'm just going to write it like this. A little bit more non-trivial, the kinematics. Um, so basically, the dipole is very small, but it can interact at different positions in the nucleus, right? And if, so, if, so I can can interact at the top of the nucleus, the middle of the nucleus, or wherever, right? So that's the impact parameter, if you like, right? But its size is very small, so things depend on size and where the nucleus it is. Now the nucleus is completely uniform. Right, all the new is so dense that all the new nucleons kind of form a two dimensional sheet, right, of color. Then the impact parameter is not so important. Okay, so, so in most of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to assume that it's uniform in impact parameter. <clears throat> so, in that case, then this would just give me pi r squared, right, the transverse area of the nucleus, two dimensional transverse area of the nucleus. So, that's what this B is. So, this object is a little bit or non-trivial, and this is telling you that what is the color distribution of the nucleus, okay, at the position at which the quark and the anti-quark hit it. So that's related to this whole A that I have. And I'm assuming that it has some kind of stochastic color distribution, okay, at some scale Y naught, where Y naught is log of some, some X naught, where again, this is this Bjorkian X. And T is a scattering matrix. Uh, it's sorry, it's it's actually the scattering amplitude is one minus scattering matrix that I threw over there for, for the purpose of this discussion. <coughs> now so again, I return back to this object here. So remember this F was this iconal object here. In QCD, it becomes something which I call a path ordered exponential, the Wilson line. And so this is this path ordered exponential. Um, I'm not going to describe it more. So just from that analogy there, you can see right away for the scattering, which involves one quark scattering here, another quark scattering here, I get two Wilson lines. So this object here in QCD is proportional to one or the number of colors, trace of the colors of these Wilson lines in your expert, the dagger, y perp. So the way you think about this very intuitively is that a quark comes in, it hits the nucleus, instantaneous interaction. Okay. And it's interacting, think of this fat nucleus suddenly being compressed to this disk, 
And all that color chart of all those nucleons, right? And those small distance scales are all sitting on that disk and the quark hits it instantaneously. And what happens? It gets rotated by a phase. That's all that happens to it, okay? And that phase depends on color. So that, that quark just gets a color rotation, it rotates in the internal space of its color, and that's what this Wilson line is, okay? So this quark gets rotated, this quark gets rotated, right? But it's an anti-quark, right? So it's a dagger, and that's how I get this, this expression. And this is all in the icon limit. So yesterday I went through this classification, right? And in QCD, the same argument goes through exactly the same way. The full QCD Hamiltonian simplifies in this high energy limit just the scattering of the quark of this shock wave and the anti quark of the shock wave is both get replaced. That's it. But now these guys depend on the color distribution. Right, so the whole thing will depend on color, and so so that's why I need to average over with some weight, which I haven't specified yet. So let's now look at this case where I now emit a gluon. So the gluon also gets phase rotation, but before I do that, let's talk about how I do the one loop corrections. Um, Any questions? Uh, don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just wondering that when you consider this virtual photon scattering with a uh, nucleus, and we say, okay, we split into a, a 50 bar pair, um, why, don't we, why don't we ever consider the very good question. Excellent question. So I actually had my notes in the diary. So 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 let's do that, right? So so that's an excellent question. So think about again my nucleus, right? And so what you're saying is think you have a quark in here, right? So let me draw the quark like that. So okay, it has a trajectory or or so, something like that. And so what you're saying is that my virtual photon could come and hit the quark, right? And then the quark could get accelerated. Okay. And so, for example, if I write down, so you might've seen this in either Ian Stewart or, or Sturman's lectures. So the lowest order process in Q, even you compute a part on distribution functions is something like this. Yeah. And so this object compared to this diagram, Just kind of like my dipole diagram. <laughs> so right now I have a new one initiated process, right? This shock unit. This is suppressed by a factor of X compared to this. Okay. And, and fundamentally, you kind of see that because when you draw, if you remember, I draw the shape of the PDFs. So the quark PDFs. So this is U balance, uh, D balance, right? And at small x, this went to zero by the new one sort of exploded. Okay. Okay. So really, so the dark, so when you go to small x, it's really suppressed by whole power of x. Okay. It's this contribution. So it's like yeah. even larger than the alpha s. Um, exactly, because it's a power law and alpha goes as a law. Okay. 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 So when you go to say x of 10 to the minus three, this is a thousand that of the other diagram, parametric. Okay. Okay. So, and, and you see that, so this is exploding, right? When you go, to, when you, once you get 10 to the minus three, this difference is huge. It's reflected in the data. Excellent question, thank you. Yeah, so please keep it coming. Yeah, this is a very important point because, you know, when you write things down, you can write down all the possible diagrams in your head and say, which is big, which is small, and yeah. it's exactly what it is. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Yeah. So kind of like the justification of this type of picture rely on that. We already know that the yeah. will, will go higher in those minds, right? Right. So so that's right. In QCD, right? 
So, so in the case of the QED language, right, that's, uh, yeah, you know, you don't have, uh, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is very general, exactly. But we are assuming that the splitting functions for a gluon going to further gluons is enhanced by a factor one of rex probability to produce gluons higher. And that's a generic feature of these vector theories. Of course, in QC, QED, you don't have photons going into protons, so that's a qualitative difference. So, so for example, I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about this in her lectures, but let me expound on that a little bit further. So if you think about now this dipole, and so this was the lowest order diagram. So think of the shock wave as just this one scattering here, right? Um, in, gen in general, it can include multiple scatterings, but let's just assume it's just one scattering. So this is the photon view one fusion. Um, now, in principle, when you go to next order, you could emit a gluon, right? Like what I'm talking about here, right? So this gluon could be emitted here or it could be emitted from here. Um, but you could ask, well, why not, instead of this emission, you could also have something like that, right? Uh, and that would be highly suppressed, okay? So that only comes in at uh, higher order. So, so, so it's really the whole cascade, if you like, is driven by gluon one emissions. And that's really a consequence of the vector nature of gluons. I'll, I'll come back to that in somewhat more detail later, if I have the time, uh, to make that even clearer. So for now, I'm doing one loop calculation, right? So let's talk about now this one loop calculation. So I have, now let me draw it in this way here. And then I have the shock wave. So why have I written that diagram this way? Think of this as being some cut where this is the amplitude and this is the complex conjugate amplitude, right? Like this, when I write this is one diagram like this. And so this is kind of, so now I emitted a gluon. So I can have all possible gluon, right? This diagram that I wrote here, where I'm emitting a gluon, that's just one of many possible Feynman diagrams I can write down. I can have a gluon emission like this. I can have a gluon emission like that, right? These are all so-called virtual corrections. I can have a gluon emission like this, right? And then I can have a gluon emission, which is where the gluon is cut, that it goes on shell, and that's this diagram that I wrote here. So I have to include all real and virtual diagrams when I do loop computation for QCD, right, or QED. Uh, and so if, let's just look at this one particular virtual diagram. So again, let me just draw this here. So let me just draw this diagram like this, for this particular one. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the last diagram you, uh, you drawn before you release it. Sorry. Uh, you have the one one and uh, you didn't have it in complex conjugate amplitude, right? That's yeah, that's a virtual. So you need fraction. to integrate over, over the dead ones. Sorry? You need to integrate over yes. the dead yeah, Virtual. Otherwise, you wouldn't have exactly in the final set. So it's it's that's why it's virtual, right? Okay. It's not a visible gluon. It's 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 so a real gluon would is actually uh, that's that's a definition of a cut. You put that gluon on shell, and it's uh so let's look at this diagram here. So, um, so this color factor, so I have this wave functions as I said, again, just the leading order results in terms of light first. But now if I look at just the color factors, then what I get from this diagram is I get a trace for the color factor TA, TA, because it's on the same line. I have some V of X perp, V diagonal of Y perp, so that's the place where the shock wave hits this guy here. And then with this additional factor of alpha s. So specifically, you get some two alpha s. And then you get some integral over the momentum of this virtual blue one, as someone asked. So you get some integral 
And so instead of working fully in momentum space, I can work in momentum space for this guy and coordinate space for transverse degrees of freedom. I can always do that. And has this form. So where does this come from? This interesting factor. And this basically just comes from the probability for a quark emitting gluon. one. Okay, so we have a quark. So because the quark's emitting a gluon one here, it's reabsorbing it here, right? So if you have quark emitting a gluon, one, so it's Q going to Q and P, this probability is just 2G PA, right? Epsilon. So this is the polarization tensor times k perf, or k perf squared. Mm -hmm. So this is this is just the white sugar Williams, you know, probability to the gluon. So there's a coupling, there's a color factor, there's a polarization of the gluon, and then this is its momentum. Right? If you just take the Fourier transform, this guy it's two ig. Just take the Fourier transform. This is 2ig pi pa epsilon lambda dot x perf minus e perf or x perf is e perf. So this is just the two dimensional Fourier transform of this object. So k perf or k perf squared goes to x perf or x perf squared, except that it's multiplied by the equilibrium. So this probability, right, twice over. What gives you this factor here? So, so I've done do this one loop diagram. Now you have to do them for all different positions, everything, right? You have to add them all up. You add them all up, you get something nice. So that's a good exercise. So just go through all the different diagrams that you could possibly think of in your head, right? Without missing any, right? And all you have to keep track is where the TAs sit, whether it's should before the shockwave or after the shockwave. There is a complication, which is if it goes, if the new one goes through the shockwave, so if you had something like this, then it's this color rotation is not in the fundamental representation of the group, it's in the adjoint representation. So this is a U, which is then some fact ordered exponential, which involves the adjoint color matrix, okay? not the, but there's a nice trick you can use where you can write these U's in terms of these using feared side instance. So here's, allows you to write these adjoint guys in terms of the fundamental guys. And so you can, with that one caveat, you can write all the diagrams all together. And remember the essence is just this very, very simple Fourier transform of this, this object here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. minus y perp times y perp minus z. Shouldn't this be symmetric in no. and y perp? No, no, because the diagram that I drew was just on one of those guys. Size. There's other diagrams which will depend on y perp, z perp. And in fact, my final result will demonstrate that. Okay. So, and that's the part that you have to do a little homework on. Okay. So, so the final answer is that the, so now I'm just going to write down the S matrix, not the T matrix, the S matrix. Right, so this is one minus S is P. So my final answer is minus alpha S N C squared Y, which is log of one over X, divided by two pi squared times just the wave function for the leading order guy times D squared. C perp 
expert minus y per divided by expert minus z per squared, z per minus y per squared times s of expert y per minus s of expert z per minus s, sorry, times s of z per y per. So now you see that when you include all the diagrams, so so I was I cheated. I was just looking at this diagram, right? And that's on the same. But in principle, you could look at this. You could look at all possible combinations. Right? So you would get now. This is nothing but the famous PFKL kernel that you may have heard of. And in fact, if you do the following, right, now you use the fact that S, that T is equal to one minus S, right? The T matrix, the scattering amplitude, right? Whose modulus squared is the cross section. So if you assume that S is, is, uh, is large, right? So T is much less than one. So if I write S equal to one minus T, I can expand leading order T, then this expression, right, can be written, see, because this is now the product of two S's, right? But if I just linearize to linear order T, then the expression that I get is, is much simpler. Basically, it's just T uh, minus T of X Y plus T of X Z, Plus T Y. And this equation is nothing but the FKL equation. Okay. Yeah. Well, you have to do something further. Well, this is the integral version of the BFKL equation. If you take the derivative of this with respect to dy, okay, then uh, the final expression in terms of t's is basically, if I, sorry, if I now write this in terms of t, then this has a form. So this is to be a okay. field. Let me write it more deeply because it deserves that. I think the BFKL equation deserves to be written deeply. So let me do that. That so much deserves some respect. But, so. Um, and so this is, and I'm going to explain these averages. So, so this is the equation that was derived by by Alevsky, Fadim, Kurab, and Kharov from in in Petersburg. Different institute, uh, and so. Yeah, this was kind of a landmark thing. And if you actually look at the original BFKL, 
their mission is just so elaborate. The paper is impossible to read. Okay? Um, and actually, it, it was only when someone almost 20 years later wrote a very nice paper explaining all the different steps that went into that derivation that I finally understood it. So there's a very nice review by uh, Victoria Del Duca, just my fellow graduate student here at Stony Brook eons ago. Um, and uh, this is from 1985, where he really goes through all the steps of this BFL derivation, great detail for code QCD. And if you're interested, you can take a look at that. So, and then go back and read the detail. That's what I would recommend. Uh, but in this derivation, you can see in this language of Wilson lines, it's you know, it's almost repeated. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the remarkable thing. Now, this object has many beautiful properties, and I guess you talked uh, a little bit about that. It, it's, uh, it has some very striking formal properties. Uh, it's homomorphically separable. It can be related in some generalization to a vacuum solvable model, which uh, satisfies infinite conservation laws, uh, really beautiful physics that was worked out by Professor Carpin's colleagues, uh, Padev and Kochemsky, uh, uh, and then Kennedy by Ricardo. Perkins worked more on that. Uh, now, what does this equation do, right? So, why should we give a damn about this equation? What this equation does is it something neat. Is that it uh, essentially effectively allows you to do Feynman diagrams to all orders of perturbative QCD uh, in some very specific kinematics. Okay. So, suppose you are you know, a monster calculator, right? And you say, okay, I want to calculate, you know, say two gluons scattering into N gluons. Okay. So I have two gluons coming in, I have N of them coming out. I want to compute things to arbitrary orders of perturbation theory. Okay, I'm going to do all loops, I can bring through all corrections like this, okay, to all orders. So how I, would I set about organizing this? Well, the first observation I would make is that if I just first focus on just two ones alone, I don't forget about quarks for the time being, I'm just looking at only two one diagrams. Then the first thing I notice is that each rung of any ladder, what I find is I always find factors of mass. And then just like I did in my one loop computation, I'll find terms which are of this sort, right? If you remember, uh, that's what I had when I was doing this, I erased that here, but I had this kind of diagram, except this I did in coordinate space, but it was the same thing. Okay, I could have done it in momentum space. And so what I would find then is that at each rung, I would find logs in Q squared. Let's say this was going up Q squared, and this was controlled by say X, I so always assume that there's some lambda QCD scale. And then I would get some logs of you know, some reference X on or X. Right? And so when I do all my comp, if I keep doing all these higher and higher order calls, I, I get arbitrary powers of these guys. Okay. Through any given order. So it's horrendously complicated, right? <laughs> But there's a few nice things that you will immediately start to notice as you do this, as you're working hard with a bottle of vodka in your hand, or if I may, I should say that, but okay. uh, that's what people did historically. Uh, but you find that, okay, first of all, one way to organize it is that, what's that? Exactly. Okay, no comment, no comment. Okay. So it may be unrelated to. Yeah. Okay, so so the bottom line, the first thing I should bring to your attention is that so, so you can ask yourself in QCD or how can you even produce n gluons because each gluon should be suppressed by powers of alpha, right? But 
what happens is that the powers of alpha are compensated by the logs in x or the logs in q squared. If these logs are large, then this being small is compensated by this being large. So that means that that's why you can have a lot of Bremsstrahlung. So Bremsstrahlung is QCD. Use a big word, okay? It's all over the place, okay? Because it's very easy to radiate in QCD. While in QED, it's very hard, right? Because in QED, there's alpha electromagnetic sitting out here, which is a really small number, right? While in QCD, alpha S is not so small, so the logs always compensate. So as you go to say one loop, two loop, three loops, you're getting terms, you're always on the same order as, this, as the zero to loop computation. So that's why you have to learn what is called resummation, right? So, so this is, and leads to the physics of resummation. What I mean by that is you first identify Ray J regime or your Kane regime. So you say, okay, I'm only going to work in the regime where alpha logs and Q squared are very the largest logs. Okay. While alpha log of X naught over X is very small, right? So this is large X physics. So at large X, this is a log is small. So alpha, this is order alpha. While at high Q squared, this is order one. And this is the beat lap regime. That you may have heard of, right, from previous lectures. Did everyone hear the word beat lap in these this lecture series? Okay. Yeah. I, I would I would I would fault Fred if you hadn't heard these words because <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the essence of CTEC. So this is part of the brainwashing mission of CTEC. So you have to have heard of beat lap. But but the other regime is the opposite, where this is you know where this is not so big, okay. So this is a order of S, but alpha log X is now order one, right? And that's the regime that I was talking about here. So essentially what you want to do is that when you're computing your, your as a monster calculator, when you're computing your one loop, two loop, three loop diagrams, you always want to keep the highest powers of at each order of P and N, okay? While you, you, you don't care so much about the ordering of these guys. Okay, so, so you just keep them in some, you, you always resumming. Uh, and so what you're doing then is you're resumming alpha S log one Rx to all orders in perturbation theory. And then you will have say your logs in Q squared, you have the highest power of Q squared, and then you have subleading powers of Q squared and so on, that you can then systematically compute. Okay, but you're really resumming contributions. And that's what this equation does for you in one fell swoop. Okay? Essentially, instead of being a monster calculator with your favorite beverage of choice, right? If you're busy, you're, you're just doing this one loop computation in your sleep. Okay? So, so that's what it does for you. It, it really allows you to resum this, this very powerful. So basically, you're doing the two to n computation just by doing a one-loop computation, okay? So I just, and that's the power of the renormalization group, okay? The renormalization group says there's a self-similar behavior hidden within these two to n diagrams, where all I need to do is just to compute a one-loop diagram and the structure of the one-loop diagram allows me to construct the leading contributions to all loop diagrams, okay? So that's the real beauty of this. And then I can go even further. Okay, so, um, oops, I hope I didn't lose all this. Constantly struggling with notes. That's it? Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, so what's your question? No. Sure. Yeah, my question. Yeah, my question was related to the 
can we somehow uh, the main message from all this, uh, the main message we'd like to take us uh, with us from this? Right. Yeah, I'm going to come to that in one second. So what I'm saying is that the first message is that you can compute two to n scattering. So I can compute the scattering of n units okay, in some kinematic version just from this equation. And that's very relevant for heavy ion collisions, as I argued, because you produce lots of particles in heavy ion collisions. So this equation, in some sense, is the building block for how you can even generate such large numbers of particles in heavy ion collisions. Right? Because think about in a heavy ion. So it's a very good question and very apropos at this juncture, because you can say, well, if I have the scattering, think of these as two ions, two gluons from the two ions, right? How do I produce a large number of particles, right? And then this, this tells us this is the leading dynamics I can calculate. So it's very relevant from that perspective. Are you familiar with notes? How do you get rid of this? Okay, I'll, I'll somehow manage. This thing will sit here. Sorry. Uh, this, okay, there it came back. Magic. Okay. Am I, so, so Fred has given me the mandate to go on until you guys drop from exhaustion. Ooh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so so let me. Uh, so okay, at least I got you to. So 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 there was a very good question. What you know? What is you know? What does this all mean? Why should I care? And so on. But I didn't finish the whole story with the BFKL equation itself. Okay. And that, that story gets even more interesting because um, you remember when I wrote this form, right? It came from a form of the kernel, which was this S of X per Y per, right? Which is a scattering matrix minus S of X per uh, Z per times S of Z per Y per, right? And then what I did was I replaced this by one minus T everywhere, one minus T, one minus T, right? Um, and this is going to be relevant for the moment, okay? But to again pursue your, your question is I can actually solve this equation. And so when I solve this equation, what I find is that this object, the T matrix, has a structure which is given by size of the dipole. Okay, so this is Q naught squared over Q squared, basically. And it goes as E to the lambda alpha s bar y divided by 2 pi theta alpha s bar y e to the minus log squared or Q naught squared over Q squared. Required by two beta plus or so. What this tells you is that the scattering amplitude grows exponentially with the rapidity. It's one over x. Um, and so, at very at small x, this guy goes as one over x to some power, which is this lambda. <clears throat> What's lambda? So lambda is a number, which is 2.77. Uh, sorry, 2.77, yes, 2.77. It's four log two. Oh, beta, beta. And beta, thank you, is proportional to zeta three. So it's 28, the Raymond zeta function, three is, This, by the way, yeah, and then this is multiplying alpha s bar, right, which is alpha s in c over pi. So in QCD, it's about roughly alpha s. 
So this number is one over x to 0.5 for alpha s r So what this tells you is that the cross section, right, for the dipole. So remember, the dipole cross section is proportional to this expectation value. This is the expectation value here. This is what I call average D. So the dipole cross section grows as some power law in X. Okay, and that explains also this very rapid growth of PDFs. So in fact, this then leads to a problem, okay? Because in the theorem in QCD, so remember that X is like one, that X is like one word, the energy, right? So this growth is roughly S to the power of 0.5. From the BFKL equation, so this is telling you that the cross section is growing, it's just exploding with energy. And so that violates the theorem in, uh, in quantum field theory, specifically in, in UCD, it's called the Frossard bound, which says that the cross section asymptotically cannot grow faster than the log square of the, uh, of the energy asymptotically as opposed to infinity. And this is a theorem that comes from the unitarity of the theory. And so this growth will violate uh, this unitarity of the theory. So it leads to sort of a fundamental problem. And so the way you understand this problem is can be understood again intuitively in very pictorial terms is that, um, let me, I hope I can erase this. So what's what's happening with the BFKL equation, right? It's, what you're saying is that again, you have this virtual proton, it's going into some quark into sort of pair, and you're starting to emit muons. And this BFKL equation is telling you that you start to produce lots and lots of muons. But now this is an ordering in in momentum or in rapidity, right? So it's an ordering in x. One, X2, X3, and so on. But if you look at this in the impact parameter plane of the of this object, essentially what so if you look inside the nucleus, what you're seeing is you have a few gluons, and then the number of gluons start to glow. So if, if you're a probe which, is, which has a fixed size, right? Then and if you so you can also imagine this as coming from the excitation of the nucleus, say, okay? So think of this object, quantum mechanics, it's either from an excitation of the nucleus that you're looking at or the excitation of the virtual photon. So what this dipole then is seeing is a large number of these guys. And so the density of this is starting to grow. It's become very large. At some point, these blue ones will start to overlap and see each other. And they start to interact with each other. And so this is genuinely many body physics. So this is the many body physics. So, so in other words, if you ask, you know, what's the phase space density of the gluons that's being pulled by the dipole, right? Which is being described by this evolution equation, the FPL. <laughs> The phase space density is greater than one. Okay, so there's more than one gluon per unit momentum per unit rotation. It's getting very, very dense. Now, the equation that I wrote for you here actually contains the answer to one possible answer to how this is being regulated. And the answer is very simple. Is that if you expand this equation out, 
right? So remember, I wrote the BF, this equation, this evolution equation is one minus T. And then I assumed that T was small. But if I don't assume that T is small, right? Then this equation in terms of T becomes something which is um, minus T x perp y perp plus T x perp z perp plus T of z perp y perp. And then there's a term which is quadratic. Okay, so it's give x perp z perp times T of z perp. So this becomes nonlinear. Okay. So the left hand side, which is linear and t, starts to depend on a term which is nonlinear. And it turns out that this term can compensate for the growth that's caused by this thing here. So what I'm saying is that so this the left hand side of this equation is dp by dy. Okay, and, and if I just had these first three terms. It was leading to this exponential growth of t, right? But if I add this term, which is there, I just threw it away, right? Then for t equal to one, you see that this, this uh, actually, this should be a minus. So t equal to one, this expression goes to zero. So basically, there's a fixed point for this evolution where the thing just kind of turns over by itself. So in other words, if I draw, so you can draw this behavior of this P matrix um, the following way as a function of the size of the dipole. And what you find describes is that, so let's say T equal to one is here. And then this is a function of our perp. It has this behavior that kind of goes up like this at some given Y. Uh, and then it starts increasing very fast, okay, with, with increasing y, right? The increase here is very fast when t is small, but it flattens out, okay? And it kind of flattens out like this. So, and there's a characteristic scale that defines this flattening out where the theory restores unitarity okay, by itself. And that scale is called saturation scale. So there is a characteristic value r per. So this is a function of size of the dipole. So there's a characteristic <laughs> size of the dipole for which the dipole and kind of uh, becomes a order when, when this thing becomes a order one. So there's a characteristic scale which denotes that, and that's called the saturation scale. And so this is the phenomenon of the one saturation. And this occurs typically when the phase space density that I was mentioning is very large phase space density, which is on the order of um, So Fred, how am I doing? Um, probably, probably ought to start wrapping up. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions at this point? Please. Yeah. Can you explain this before, then we'll right. just drop it. No, no, no. That's it happy to see it again. So I, what I don't understand is what the size of the dipole has to do with this gluon cascade that's coming off one fourth Q bar line that, and being exci excited movements. Excellent. Yeah, I kind of brushed over that point a little bit. So the same exercise that I did starting from this, the dipole and emitting one gluon and then showing that you get this RG description, I could have done also starting from the nucleus. And the framework in which that is done is called the color glass condensate. Um, where you can actually show this. Um, it's a mathematical framework. 
where you can think in terms of the evolution of the wave function nucleus, and you get a universal description from both sides. So then if I just think about the diagram, now scattering of the evolved nucleus. So I started with some classical field of the nucleus, and then I let that change, right? I added quantum corrections to that classical field, and that classical field evolved. Then it's the size of the dipole that's scattering of this classical field. That's a very localized, that's an excellent question. And this, the size of this object, right, where it sees this very high occupancy one over alpha is this one over QS. Okay. Yeah. If the QQ bar is in, do we care what representation it's in for SU3 if it's in a singlet versus? Uh, so so it's, it's always a singlet, right? So because it's coming from a virtual photon, mm -hmm. right? But but because it's smaller than the size of one over lambda Q3, right? <clears throat> Individual color chargers of these objects will see color within the, with the nucleus, right? And that's why those quarks get color rotated, you know, in the scattering, right? And so you can view this. So there's a dual picture <coughs> that you can think about this QQ bar is scattering off a very dense cloud of objects, right? And it has multiple scattering. Right, but also it, you can think of this in terms of a very large phase space density of gluons inside the inside the, inside the hadron of the nucleus, and that gives you kind of like a dual description in terms of how to think about it. So if you think about it as a state inside the wave function of the nucleus, then it's this very highly occupied state that you encountered, and that mathematically is corresponds to the saturation of this probability for scattering. Okay, it tells you that it scatters with unit probability. And this is true, by the way, for arbitrarily small QQ bars at very, at, uh, um, at small x. So let me write down the equation that encapsulates that to leading order. So think of it the following way, is that, um, so the equation for this, so let me this dipole cross section can be written as some cross section, let's call it sigma naught. So it's one minus some exponential minus r curve squared. So this is for a given size. Uh, and then there's also some log factor. <clears throat> so what this tells you is that so if if r per think of r perp as one over qs squared okay so qs squared is very large and let's say qs is a function of x pure in x or energy right so let's say r perp is on size one over q squared and q squared is very large right such that you are the regime where r perp squared times qs squared is much less than one <clears throat> Okay, so, so this is like saying Q squared or Q squared is much less than one, right? That's for W QCD. I can expand out this exponential, right? And then this dipole cross section is proportional to R perp squared log of one over R perp lambda. I'm just give it you. And this is what's called color transparency. This is just for W QCD. And what color transparency tells you is that the, the cross section for the dipole to scatter of the nucleus decreases with smaller size of the dipole, right? So Q squared goes to infinity and R goes to zero, right? The cross section vanishes. So essentially that's per of QC, it just goes through, right? It doesn't interact because it's so small. It becomes essentially colorless, right? The dipole becomes colorless. And so, so at very small dipoles don't interact, and that's per QC. speed. But there's this opposite limit when this is larger than one or a order one, right? And so in that limit, so if I look at this formula in that limit, then for R per squared QS squared you know, greater than or equal to one, then this exponential 
is very large. It's sort of it's this, this argument is very large. So the same yeah. thing goes to zero, right? Exponentially. So essentially the cross section sigma dipole goes to a constant. Because they can drop the whole exponential. When QS squared and R per squared is much greater than one, this exponential dies off, right? This is a constant. And so this is sometimes called color opacity. Also known as the black fix this limit, because if I integrate over a back parameter, this is well, this is just pi r squared, right? It's proportional to cross section. So this, this regime is accessed even if R prep is very small, but QS is large. So, and at very small X, QS grows with X, so QS, so the scale, right, of QS is proportional to this one over X to the lambda, coming from BFK. So as I go to smaller and smaller X, this QS gets bigger and bigger, right? And so even if the dipole is very small, Right, QS is very large. This is satisfied. The dipole cross section is very large. So this is again saying that even this is the radio limit that even the dipole is very small. If you're sufficiently high energies, it interacts with unit probability. So that's the opposite limit to the Bjorkian limit, where it's just transparent. And this is very dense. Okay, and so that's the physics of gluon saturation. Um, actually, if I could yeah. suggest we save questions, uh, right. we can multitask. We'll go to the coffee break. Uh, can you stay for a while? I can stay. Yeah. For, so, so if that's okay, I we'll... can stay till you know I drop for exhaustion or you guys drop for exhaustion. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because we, we we do have a little. Let's see. Let's have a competition. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, let's let's go ahead and thank Raj and Al. We'll, we'll take the full coffee. I, so uh, I'll give you a chance to ask the questions, but we do have to do some bureaucratic stuff. So, uh, Sukhra, if you want to give them kind of the overview. Sure. Well, the bureaucratic stuff is that you do get a certificate for attending, um, but in exchange for the certificate, I need your mail cards back. <laughs> so if... Uh, if oh, and... and, and, and oh, oh, oh. So, so uh, I mean, you know, uh, Alexia, Alexia and I have been up here in front of the, uh, you know, front of the uh, auditorium, but uh, Socorro has been in the back room making all things happen. Things like, like your parking tickets are fixed and you have blankets and sheets and you have foods and deal card. And normally we have three people doing this, uh, but uh, long story short, she picked up the whole thing. So all that back, back, uh, back room operation, and things like that that made it run smooth. Yeah, you guys have wonderful. We also like that's a card signed by. Oh, thank you so much. So yeah, let's let's give her another round of applause.